Well, uh, it's, it's great to see so many people here. I was one of the authors of this report that we're talking about today, and you write these things, and I've written many, and you do wonder who might be interested and who's going to read it, or are we all talking to ourselves or whatever. So uh, grateful that you're all here, and my role is to try and give you an overview of this report, if I can push this right button. Uh, I've changed the title slightly, Transitioning to a Low Carbon Future, um, but the world according to STAP, because this is what this report is all about. And I should say as well, that photograph there is taken just by my town, Palmerston North in New Zealand, that uh, some of you have actually visited, I know. And uh, it's surrounded by wind turbines. We've even named the rugby team the Turbos after the wind turbines. <laughs> and, and there's no subsidies in New Zealand where we're up to 75% renewable electricity now, so we're all quite proud of that. But where is New Zealand? Because I know some of you might have been. We quit a quick meeting yesterday, and there was a map on the board again, and New Zealand had dropped off the edge of the map, and off the dust, but it's sort of down the bottom there, as you can see. But you see, if you actually change the map of the world so it's grown properly, then there it is. And this is where we are, and that's where I flew on Tuesday or Monday, whatever it was. And the point about this is I'm responsible for 0.87 tonnes of carbon dioxide to get here, and I've got to get home again yet. The reason I'm telling you that is because I do own a forest. I own a fifth share of 200 acres of pine tree yata, and that's absorbing my carbon dioxide. It's now actually at that size there, and I've got carbon credits under the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme. The point about this is I've got some for sale, so if anybody needs any, <laughs> let me know during the reception. <laughs> Anyway, we're here to talk about this report, and I should acknowledge that I was one of five authors, and Ravi, Professor Ravi Dranath, Ravi Dranath was my predecessor on staff, and he is involved with IPCC, Diana urch Borsat's involved with IPCC, and myself, and uh, Milo Viraput, and uh, a couple of others, including Lev Nerriton, I don't know where Lev is here, from, from staff, but just here, who had a key role to play in pulling it all together too. So we acknowledge everybody in, in this report, and I'm going to spend just uh, six or seven minutes to try and explain what's in there. There are some copies available outside, and it's always nice to hold one, but you can get an electronic version as well. So the aim was to provide an update of recent scientific findings to assist Jeff formulated strategies and priorities for Jeff 6, which we've heard about, and help the world move towards a low carbon green economy. Fourth assessment report came out in 2007. Fifth assessment report that I just mentioned at the end of this presentation is due out end of this year and going into next year. And so this was the, the filler in between. A couple of quick slides here just to set the scene, although Joe's already done this. This is taken from the IAA. And I was based at the IAA for four years and in fact was involved in the 450 policy scenario when we first developed that in 2008. So, uh, as we all know, business as usual, current policy scenarios is taking us <coughs> to a high temperature. The 450 is around the 2 degrees. Incidentally, in the um, fifth assessment report, the range will probably be from 2 to 4 degrees, not 2 to 5 degrees, uh, as the climate scientists are sort of reviewing the, the knowledge. But if we look at what um, IEA World Energy Outlook also says, is the breakdown of these um, wedges into this reduction, mitigation reduction potentials. And you can see the whole list down there of end-use efficiency, power plant efficiency, etc. So energy efficiency reduces CO2 emissions by about 6.4 gigatons, according to the world of IEA, which is slightly different to the world of UNEC, but the same sort of message is coming out uh, by 2035. <coughs> but the share falls by 2035 as more renewables and carbon dioxide capture and storage are coming on stream. And then I mean, you can see there's biofuel, nuclear, etc. all in there too. And this report, this uh, Jeff report, covers all of those technologies and um, hopes to bring them up to date. I won't bother about the structure of the report in detail, but there are eight chapters, as you can see, listed there. There is a section on short-lived uh, short climate forces and geoengineering, and even we did mention the word nuclear, which in some places is uh, not a good word to use, like in New Zealand, um, but it's a key component, obviously, of the low carbon future. Uh, there is this diagram which comes from the uh, AR4, the fourth assessment report, which I was involved with. I led the energy supply chapter, in fact, and Diana, who was a co-author of the Jeff report, led the buildings chapter, and Ravi was in the agriculture chapter. The message from this is it's similar to, again, what Joe's just showed us. 
that there are many technology opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, but they will require substantial resources, innovative means, and sustainable development to continue. So that's the challenge we've got. The, the reason I put this slide in is because I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because this was 2007 report and we've had the UNEP report and we've had the Global Energy Assessment which weighs 5.2 kilograms if you've got a copy of that and, and, and we're writing all these reports and we have done for a decade or two and they're all giving the same messages all the IAA World Energy Outlooks and ETPs etc. So the message is there, there's nothing new, but we keep writing them, rewriting them, and the same authors are involved. So how do we break out of actually writing about it and actually doing something? Of course, I'm privileged to be now part of the JET, where I feel as though we are making a difference, and that's uh, encouraging. So the recommended focus for the new JET strategy towards the green economy was what this report was about. Undertake an optimization approach to provide systemic solutions rather than support single technologies. Support more complete systems that encompass a combination of climate mitigation and adaptation measures across the key focal areas that the JET has got. And a couple of examples, green cities, which include building designs, improved transport systems, again, we just heard from Joe, and smart food systems, including water, land, energy, and climate, are systemic themes highlighted in this report. So we were, we were trying to get a, a feel for what the world is like and what it needs and how it's a bit different to what's been done in the past. And this is starting, I think, to develop the Chisholm Show and others into the uh, JET strategy. So the key message is very quickly, severity of climate change impacts will continue to impact on the delivery of global environmental benefits across all focal areas. So the JET should, and there's six here, but there's about 20 listed in the report, Adopt strategies to screen for climate risks using appropriate indicators and incorporate resilience enhancement measures in all of its programs. Focus on optimization of systems by supporting countries leading the technology transition rather than concentrating on single technologies. Same point as before, but emphasized. Support countries by identifying options for achieving transformational shifts and leapfrogging opportunities towards low carbon pathways. Encourage sustainable food supply systems, it's the whole system, not just the agriculture, but right the way through the food supply chain. Integrated with energy use, water use, nutrient cycling, climate resilience. Respond to climate change in urban systems by combining approaches to land use planning, buildings, transport, water supply, waste treatment, food security, chemical management, biodiversity, coastal management. Cities are complex uh, entities. Support policies, measures and practices at the local government level, which is a little bit different to uh, the national level, of course. And that can engage with citizens on the climate change challenge and the need to adapt. So there's some innovative ideas there and adopt the Apalu approach to land use change, forest, soil, carbon, methane emissions, etc. So overall, the JEF should assist recipient countries to assess, select and evaluate their technologies, policies, measures, regulations, financial incentives and needs, technology transfer mechanisms and their institutional capacity, which is a key component, in order to enable them to rapidly make transformational shifts to a low carbon pathway consistent with national sustainable development goals. So this is what this report's all about, and we think we've tried to encompass all those areas in there, and we hope that it's um, being used. I'll spend two slides, if I can, Tom, on the IPCC fifth assessment report. IPCC is a four-letter word in my household now. This is the fourth report I've been in, I think, involved with. Uh, working Group 1 starts coming out at the end of this year, September, I think, adaptation and early next year. I'm involved in mitigation, and I'll just mention a couple of slides on that, and that's due out in uh, May next year. And then we're starting to compile the synthesis report now, um, which covers all of those working groups. In terms of um, working Group 3 in particular, just two slides really. What's new since the AR4 in 2007? We don't want to keep repeating the same stuff and rewording and coming up with different diagrams, etc. And so it is difficult to say what is new. I'm leading the transport chapter. And what's new in transport? And Joe's just given some examples, and we're trying to work on that. Aviation, shipping, and freight, etc. included as well. But it is a challenge to say, concisely what's in the literature, what's in the science that's new in the last five or six years. So we're choosing among climate policies is, is intrinsically an exercise in risk management due to the interacting sources of uncertainty. 
So one of the key areas across the AR5 is to deal with these interactions of sources and uh, uncertainty. So in terms of working group three, this is a, a diagrammatic representation of the whole report. So chapters two to four there, that's the part one, and that's the framing chapters, issues of risk and uncertainty, economic and ethical concepts and methods, sustainable development and equity. If you're familiar with AR4, this is a different approach. And then we've got the transformation pathways with all the sectors, energy, transport, etc. But we've got chapters five and six, and chapter five describes the present situation, and chapter six is the integrated assessment models, which I'll just mention briefly shortly. And then finally, part three of this report is policies and institutions, as you can see listed at the top there. So there is a difference between AR4 and AR5. Some of you may be reviewing it. Second order drafts out for review now of working group three. We've got cross-cutting issues in there. Bioenergy, the inevitable bioenergy comes everywhere, and it's always a problem. I started my life making biodiesel from animal fat in 1973. Not my life, my career. And, and bioenergy is now a special annex in, in agriculture in this report. Life cycle analysis. Uh, analysis. This is, in my chapter alone, we must have about 100 emails about the values of LCA and what they mean and the limitations. You can prove anything you want with an LCA, depending on what assumptions you put there. So that's a whole annex to the report. Costs and potentials are coming across very difficult to manage, but uh, we're doing that uh, at the moment. Co-benefits and risks are in there. Behavioural issues, concentrating on those, sustainable development impacts, and top-down scenarios versus bottom-up analyses. I'll give you two examples of this. Business as usual, global transport demand projections compared with the 2010 base. This is passengers, kilometres per year for, for different um, stabilisation levels. I'm not going to go into the detail. The point about this is we are going through over a thousand <coughs> integrated assessment model scenarios, putting them together, seeing if we can make sense out of them. So this is the growing demand for passenger kilometres of all sorts, aviation road, and this is the freight. They're all tracking up, it's all, every scenario shows the same. But in terms of reduction of potentials, OECD and EIT in developing countries, different sort of circumstances, but that's how we're doing this top-down, bottom-up type approach to try and find out what the integrated assessment models uh, are saying and what we think the transport sector is saying. Because there are some differences. How fast will electric cars develop and those sort of things are real. So I'll just um, uh, finish off by saying that the um, uh, IAA and the World Energy Outlook this year shows how quickly things are changing in the energy climate change world. And if you read this, you'll see that, and I'm sure most of you in the audience know, that the US will become independent of oil and gas imports within the next 20 to 30 years, which is an amazing turnaround in a very short space of time. And I was horrified yesterday. We had a meeting, and I went for a run uh, after the meeting to get a bit of exercise and get rid of the jet lag and things. And I was horrified to find out that they're actually fracking in the middle of the streets of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I took that photograph yesterday afternoon. This is a concern. <laughs> Be aware. Now, I was on my run, now, just to finish up my last slide, I did go to, uh, I ran across the park or whatever, and I've got this summed up where we are today. Men and nature must work hand in hand. The throwing out of balance of the resources of nature throws out of balance also the lives of men. And I thought that just sums up where we are with climate change. Thank you.